Welcome to the year 1962 of Soviet space program. January 5th, the administration building upgrade has completed, now boasting a maximum of eight program slots. At this point, we can finally close out early Earth observation satellites, which is beginning to decline in the funding curve. With two open slots now available, unmanned lunar exploration is accepted at FAST. Early communication applications is moving along just fine while acting as the main source of farming confidence. Early interplanet probes is heading into a major funding decline, with the Mars objective still remaining. A transfer window is opening in the fall, so the most important objective this year is to get a pair of probes sent to the Red Planet. Advanced Crewed Orbit is mostly locked behind the Cosmonaut Complex upgrade as well as technologies, so the only forward progress that can currently be accomplished is the first rendezvous contract. We finally have the first major upgrade of the Cosmos 1, launching the first Molnia satellite. The Cosmos 1 Block 2 is changed to a three-stage design, while still staying within the 65-ton LC limit. The LC only needs a seven-day modification, with changes included stretching the height to 29 meters and the addition of new ground support equipment for propellants. The RD-0109 is replaced with two RD-119 stages, which have an increased ISP as well as the ability to restart in orbit. A 200 by 800 kilometer orbit is achieved with an inclination of 65 degrees. In order to reach the Molnia parameters, a kick needs to be performed near the South Pole and create an orbital period of 12 hours. By starting in a 200 by 800 kilometer orbit, this allows the transfer to be completed in a single burn and not require the extra kick at apogee. About 2500 delta V is set and the command is sent to the probe for execution. The RD-119 only has the capability to restart a single time, and this can only occur within the first 90 minutes after engine shutdown. This gives it just enough time to transit to the South Pole and execute the maneuver. The RD-119 successfully reignites and propels the satellite to its Molnia orbit. Just like the other commercial contracts, this will be transferred to its customer once the orbit has been validated for two minutes. March 26th, Alexander Yeltsin once again takes flight on a Vostok rocket. The only advanced crewed contract that can be performed at this time is the orbital rendezvous. The target in this case is the first polar satellite and to this point means that the launch will require a bit more performance to succeed. For this reason, the Vostok is launched on an experimental variant, which utilizes an RD-119 stage in the place of the original RD-0109. The high ISP is the critical factor for this choice, as the Vostok now has been equipped with a heavier maneuvering section needed to achieve this contract. Alexander reaches orbit and then plays a waiting game, as the Vostok module now has to catch up to the probe. Because the altitude difference is relatively small, it will take close to 27 hours before a maneuver can be executed for a close proximity intercept. It does not take much, as 2.5 meters per second will be enough to get the planned target approach to under 100 meters. Then, it is back to patiently waiting another 11 hours before the next maneuver can be performed. In order to match the orbit of the polar probe, the final maneuver will require close to 25 meters per second. And thankfully, we are gifted with this occurring on the day side. Several minutes later, Alexander makes visual contact and executes the maneuver to cancel out the relative velocity. The burn is executed a bit too late, as the probe falls to a quarter of a kilometer away. A very minor problem, 
as Alexander is drifting towards the probe and will be within 30 meters within a matter of two minutes. Like a choreographed dance, Alexander and the five-year-old derelict satellite move together in unison, drifting side by side at a velocity of 7,800 meters per second. Mission Control radios to Alexander, congratulating him on this success. Then gives the signal for Alexander to break away from the probe and begin the next phase of the mission. Alexander will continue to orbit the Earth for an additional nine hours, as his secondary mission was to reach the endurance record of two days in space. With that objective complete, the Vostok module then executes the deorbit maneuver to bring Alexander within the predicted landing near Plasetsk. The descent was a bit steeper than planned, and Alexander reaches his G-limit and blacks out. He regains consciousness moments later, and safely lands, completing his mission. Fifth of April is the second launch of the Cosmos 1 Block 2. The payload for this flight is a four-satellite commercial network under the Early Commercial Applications Program. The RD-119 shows its benefits again, as it will relight at Apogee to complete the orbital insertion for the payloads. With the successful insertion into a 2700 km orbit, the payloads are deployed to begin their 48-hour shakeout test. Completing that test, a generous lump of reputation is received, as well as the notice that all objectives of the program are now completed. The program may be complete, but we continue accepting more contracts. Next in line is a Cosmos 1, carrying 180 units of commercial payload on the 9th of May. As mentioned before, these contracts are the bread and butter for gaining more confidence given how quick and easy they are to launch. The launches are practically identical to one another, with the only factor being the gradual increase of the payload requirement. June 16th, another Venus window has opened up and signals the launch of Venera 2. The launch of this mission is for an optional contract under the Early Interplanet Probes program. This contract provides a significant chunk of confidence, so it would be unwise to ignore it. New science experiments have also been unlocked since the launch of Venera 1, so this probe carries a new suite of hardware as well as the next tech level of solar panels. Other upgrades that have been incorporated were newer engine configs for the RD-107, 108, as well as changing the upper stage over to the RD-0109. Reaching orbit, a 4100 Delta V maneuver is plotted to get an intercept with Venus. With the infrared radiometry and orbital permutation experiments on board, Venera 2 will have to enter in a near polar orbit. The transfer stage completes the trans-Venus injection and sends Venera 2 off towards its destination. June 8th is a launch not tied to any programs, but with a mission to only gather science. OPAIR carries aboard the infrared radiometry and orbital permutation experiments. These require long durations, with the orbital permutation needing a whole decade to complete the science. This is an important launch, as the agency will passively gain both science and confidence while this operates in orbit over the years. It is unlikely that it will be able to operate for a complete decade, but with the improved solar cells, we can hope that this will last for at least two to three years.
June 30th, Venera 2 prepares for a course correction. Just like its sister probe from last year, a minor 5 meter per second correction is executed, giving it a 300 kilometer approach at Venus. Venera 2 re-enters hibernation and will continue cruising for another 6 months. Research has been steadily moving along in the background, but it is now time to pay attention to when the second generation capsule tech will unlock. New proficiency training will be needed for the Voskhod, and with it a requirement to upgrade the cosmonaut complex once again. Funding is a bit tight at this moment, so the construction rate is throttled to 55% to not cause bankruptcy. With the Mars window coming up, the spending priority right now is to make sure the sister Marsnik probes get launched, as this opportunity will not show itself again for two years. August 16th is once again another optional contract. This time around, the payload has increased to 190 units of commercial ComSat payload, which is 10 more than the last launch. The next major program to be concerned with is Crewed Lunar, which will need over 4,000 confidence to accept at the fast pace. With the United States completing their first crewed flight earlier this year, the space race is heating up, and we must try to beat them at their own goal of landing on the moon and returning by the end of the decade. October 23rd is the launch of Marsnik 1. Compared to sending a probe to Venus, Mars poses some additional challenges which add complexity to the mission. Being further from the Sun means that more surface area or better solar tech is needed to power the probe. The distance from Mars to Earth also means there will be communication blackout periods as the tracking station tech is still in the early stages. To minimize the risk of losing comms on the way to Mars, a launch window is chosen for a slightly faster transfer time of 300 days, and the antenna on the probe is boosted in transmission power to 47 dBm. The Marsnik probe shares the same satellite bus as the Venera series, but instead utilizes hinged solar panels, which have unlocked under the early power generation and storage tech node. The improved solar tech also brings with it greater power density as well as slower degradation of the cells. Marsnik 1 enters a slow spin facing the solar panels towards the sun and flies off into space for its journey to Mars. A few days later, the sister probe Marsnik 2 is launched on the 31st of October. Given how far apart Mars windows occur, we cannot risk the chance of Marsnik 1 failing to capture into orbit, as this would delay the completion of the early interplanet probes program by two more years. Sending two probes also will help increase the science gathering capacity by putting a different set of experiments on each craft. Marsnik 2 is similar to Venera 2 in that it carries with it the micrometeorite detector, orbital permutation, and infrared radiometry experiments. Similarly, Marsnik 1 is just like Venera 1 with its suite of experiments. Because this one was launched later, a slightly faster transfer of 295 days is plotted so they both arrive around the same time and have similar signal strength back to Earth. Just like a repeat of before, a course correction is made two days after Transmars injection this time to place it in a near-polar flight path. Then, Marsnik 2 goes into hibernation as it chases the sister probe. With a trio of interplanetary probes on their way, spending can be refocused towards the Cosmonaut Complex upgrade. The construction rate is brought up to 100%, and then time has passed the beginning of December, when Advanced Capsule Era Material Science is unlocked. 
This marks a major milestone in the space program, as the agency has its first upgrade to the existing aluminum stringer tanks. Refined aluminum tanks are now unlocked and will allow considerable weight savings to both payloads and rockets. Another important part of this tech node is the improved engineering efficiency brought to all launch complexes, as well as the first multi-layer installation for cryogenic tanks. The year is not over yet, as we return to Venera 2, which has just crossed into Venus space on the 20th of December. Mission Control begins to see more signs transmitting back as the various experiments begin collecting data from the Venus High region of space. Venera 2 then initiates the command to reorient and then ignites the U-2000 capture stage at the correct moment. The probe has a total of 1600 Delta V, which is a bit excessive for the contracted orbit but it gives some peace of mind in the event that the engine experiences a performance loss. That does not end up being a concern, as Venera 2 successfully completes the capture burn, inserting it into the required orbit to meet the contract. Almost 1,000 confidence is awarded, which will be a big help for the crewed lunar program in the near future. Venera 2 then re-aims the solar panels and goes into a deep hibernation as it will collect science for the next few years. This brings us to the close of 1962. Thanks for watching and see you on the next one.